whenever I begin planning a workshop, I come to face to face with the same difficulty every time. And that is my personal orientation, the state of mind that I'm in. That might seem an odd thing to say, but quite often how we begin is how we end quite usually. So beginnings are delicate and important times. Actually, that train whistle, I thought it was somebody playing a flute yeah. for the longest time. And I was like, where is that? I would look for the flute person. Because I was down at Schumacher and it made perfect sense that someone would be wandering around in the woods playing a flute down there. Gandhi once said, the step and the destination are the same thing. It took me a long time to understand that. So it's always important how to begin. And Robert Bly touched on this when he said, many critics tend to read poetry not through their feeling sense, but through a theoretical framework. Because they are in fear of the content they might have to face if they face the poem as they faced another human being. Huh, isn't that a nice line? Because they are in fear of the content they might have to face if they faced the poem as they do another human being. Another way to put that is to tell you that we're going on a journey now. And as this Week begins, we start in one frame of mind, and then we begin moving more deeply into another. The Persian storytellers used to say, when they would start a story, they would say, on this earth there are six continents. We're now going to the seventh. It's not a metaphor, you know. So. This always entails a decision. It involves an experiential shift. I've done this many times, yet my first tendency is always to speak from my head, to hide behind a theoretical framework. It's easy to teach a workshop from up here, and it's much safer, which is, I suppose, why so many people do it that way. There's no vulnerability in it, just data, a data dump of information. When I was younger, I hid behind dissociated mentation all of the time. The statistical mentality had me firmly in its grasp. I did my best to conceal what was most human in me. And I think many of us do that. There is a belief inside me that responsible rationality did not contain a human dimension. I had come to believe my own humanness was somehow inappropriate. That only some sort of analytic dissociation would allow my observations of the natural world to be taken seriously. I have found over the years that this is a common problem perhaps one of the most serious that we all face. The ecological devastation of our interior worlds precedes that of the natural world. It's a fundamental reason, I think, for reductive science being the way that it is. Somewhere in the process, the desire to keep emotionalism out of it, to focus on verifi verifiable fact, a lot of what makes us human became suspect to them, especially our capacity for touching, for perceiving the invisibles with which we're surrounded every day of our lives. And so science began to be dominated by dissociated mentation. And there was and there still is a lot of shaming that goes on about that sort of thing. Shaming toward anyone who decides to abandon dissociated mentation. All of us who love the earth, I think, have experienced that at least once or twice. 
There are a lot of psychological reasons for this, among them a tremendous fear of feeling. And oddly enough, within science, those most fearful of feeling came to dominate the field, to determine its acceptable shape. And oddly enough, in every field I've examined, after a while, the most extreme people end up controlling its shape. Among scientists, the most reductive and extreme of them began to dominate it. The tendency to dissociated mentation became deeply ingrained and people began to censor their own humanness, their own thoughts, their own commentary, their own observations of the livingness of the world. And oddly enough, amongst scientists, the censoring is most extreme. I can't count the number of times a scholar, a researcher, has told me that they can't say what they really want to because they fear they will lose their credibility. They work to make sure that nothing they do or say violates cultural norms. The drive for self-censoring affects everybody who writes about the earth or in any way touches on the domain that scientists think that is their own, especially those of us who insist that something other than mechanical reductionism is going on here. You know, they think there's a clockwork. A contraire, my friends. Reductionism is a monocropping of our ability to engage with and understand the world. Reductionism is a monocropping of our capacity to engage with and understand the world. It is conversion by the sword merely in a different form. Mary Midgley, the English philosopher who I dearly love, says it is a form of intellectual imperialism. Dissociated mentation is what we are expected to use if we wish to appear responsible and reasonable, and you should know that I am neither responsible nor reasonable. Still, I feel the pressure to conform even after all of these years, so every time I begin to teach, I have to actively choose a different way. <coughs> I have to intentionally decide to break the cultural injunction against my human dimension being present, against speaking of things that make reductionists twitchy. <laughs> and this is never an academic or rhetorical exercise. The opposite of dissociated mentation necessitates a vulnerability of the self a decision to unconceal the self, to allow the invisibles of life to enter the room. And so, every time at the beginning I begin to look for some truth that is real for me in that moment, something that causes the deepest parts of me to unconceal themselves, something that allows me to speak from the deepest parts of myself, that allows what is most human in me to rise, come alive and open its eyes. Where what is most central in the core of my life rises up and begins, as the poet Lorca put it, to burn the blood like powdered glass. I love that. For if we wish to change the world, we must begin by changing ourselves. And that's always the hardest thing of all, you know. It's much easier to pass a law mandating the use of biodegradable bags. <laughs> a friend of mine, like, I love the French. How many French-type people are in the room today? I mean, there's some, okay, several French-type people. I love, you know, because some people from come from Quebec, you know, and uh, other places that are French-like. Um, but this friend of mine told me once, he's, a, he was my, he's my acquisitions editor at my publisher and we're great friends and he's fluent in French and he often goes over to France and he's, you know, he's, he's just a, a terrible anarchist. I mean, he's completely hilarious. So he hangs out with all of the, the more rebellious parts of the French population. 
the writers and the artists. And there was some big protest going on, and he saw a young French protester, probably a, a young woman about 23 years old, carrying a sign that said, the first act of disobedience is contemplation. I thought, the French. And this is so cool. Nobody in America would ever have a sign like that. You know, in America they'd say, you know, the first act of disobedience is fuck you. That's what we would do there, you know, because we have a gift for delicate and sophisticated language. So I love that. I've been thinking about that for years, for several, three or four years now. The first act of disobedience is contemplation. When you stop and you begin to contemplate, you begin to leave the exterior world and enter the inner world. And things begin to change. I would say one of the most important second acts of disobedience is abandoning dissociated mentation and reclaiming a different kind of thinking, a thinking based on feeling not on information and linear thought. There's a deep belief that science will find a way out of the predicament facing us. Never going to happen. Nevertheless, the search for more information goes on as if we don't know enough already. Information can be very useful, but if information by itself could change the world, the world would already be different. For we have information by the bucketful. What we lack is something else. As Einstein once put it, we can't solve the problems facing us by using the same kind of thinking that created them. Now, this is a, an amazing statement, and he had a number of amazing statements, all of which scientists have routinely disregarded ever since. And he said, I didn't learn what I did through A to B to C linear thinking. I used something else. And they go, yeah, right, sure. Here's the Nobel Prize, and I go away. <laughs> we can't solve the problems facing us by using the same kind of thinking that created them. So what I'm talking about is a different kind of thinking. I'll talk a lot about what he meant by this, but he certainly did not mean doing the same thing we were already doing just more vigorously, which is what a lot of people think. A lot of the elite groups in the academia think, oh, we'll just do it more. That's bound to turn out well. Now, I can tell looking at all of you here, every one of you has been in a relationship at least once, and every one of you has kept doing the same thing over and over and over again, even when your spouse is saying, don't do that. Stop. <laughs> we all learn the hard way, don't we? No. Einstein was concerned with a different kind of perceptual thought than dissociated mentation. The kind of thinking he was talking about is the root of holistic science, of the capacity to perceive Gaian movements, of the ability to interact with the living intelligences of the world, of the ability to work with the invisibles with which we are surrounded every day of our lives, the ability to work with meaning, the deep essence of things and not their surfaces. To do this means reclaiming the human dimension of ourselves, especially our ability to feel and to deeply care. Dissociated mentation is oriented towards surfaces. Even if they do a dissection, all they find is more surfaces. Does that make sense? You understand what I mean? They just get more and more surfaces all of the time. For many, this becomes so ingrained that our experience of what lies behind surfaces, of the metaphysical background of the world, remains mostly or sometimes completely obscured. So a German poet came up with that line, the metaphysical background of the world. I love that. You go through the surface into the metaphysical background of the world. We embrace form and forget that other phenomena with which we share this planet possess interiority. We forget that flowers and stones and the earth itself 
have interiority. We focus on form and forget and neglect the meanings held inside forms and before too long we begin to lose meaning in our own lives. We take on thingish behavior. There's a reason why in the Western world, especially the United States, that so many people are on antidepressants. Okay. Because their feelings are telling them something is wrong. And instead of going deeper into them to find out what it is, they make it go away. So they can remain oriented toward surfaces. So I struggle always when planning a workshop to find the place that lies beyond information, the place that touches the deepest meaning, meanings present in a human life, the state of being that brings that dimension of humanness alive, present, and real into the room. Some element of that has already begun, simply because I've been speaking of it, and I've been oscillating in and out of it since the beginning of my talk, sometimes a bit more deeply, sometimes more shallowly, but it can go very deep indeed. So, I'll share a story about that. So there was, uh, I lived for 10 years in the high country of Colorado in the Rocky Mountains on land that had never been logged, never been farmed, never been anything. And it was the way it had been for the last 10,000 years. Okay. Remarkable place. And I got very involved in plant medicine then, and there were about 150 plants I worked with all of the time. I spent about seven years spending four hours a day in the woods every day sitting with plants and working with them. And I began to see clients after a while, and so this young woman came to me once. Her presenting problem was she had difficult menstruation. And the interesting thing about presenting problems is they're very rarely the problem. Okay? It's just the thing that gets them there. So she comes in and she sits down and as we're talking I begin to observe her. Her skin is extremely pale and unhealthy looking. Her eyes are pinpoint, fixed. Her breathing is really rapid and shallow up high in her chest. Okay. She speaks in a monotone, and her forearms are just filled with tension just from holding on as best she can every day. So I'm talking to her for a while, and into my mind just pops the idea of this plant called Angelica. And there's a, one that grows there, Angelica Ampla. It's a traditional um, native plant there. Now the interesting thing about this stuff popping up like that it often happens, though many herbalists won't speak of it because they're afraid of being shamed. So the funny thing, there's this woman named Rosita Arvigo, right? She's a, an herbalist. She lives in Belize. You know, she's got the name Rosita Arvigo. Now everybody thinks, oh, she's like from Belize, you know. They expect a certain thing. The thing is, Rosita's from Chicago, okay? So she talks like this. And so the way she talks about the plant, which is really hilarious, she goes, so, somebody comes to you and they start talking. And that little file, card catalog file you've got in your head, it opens up and the plant jumps out and it goes, it's me. <laughs> but you don't believe it. So you keep flipping through the card catalog file and the whole time the plant's down in there going, whenever. And you got to see people's faces. As soon as she starts to talk, they're like, uh, all of their preconceptions are like wiped out, you know. So into my mind comes Angelica, and I go, oh, let's go for a walk. She says, okay. So we go out and we begin walking, and we're going over this little rise, and then we begin to drop down into this remarkable valley. We go first through this grove of aspens, and there's some of the most gentle, they're a little bit like um, birch, but they're some of the gentlest trees. Even when there's no wind, their leaves are slightly dancing all of the time. And they, 
they emit this most marvelous smell. And just walking through it, I could see her already begin to relax. And we begin going down deeper and deeper and deeper. And we begin going through this very old growth fir forest, very dark, muy peligroso. <laughs> and, you know, the sunlight's coming down, these little tiny shafts breaking through the overstory and this luminous gold. And we're walking through, and we get down to this game trail that's running along the bottom of this little stream there. And we turn left, and I let her go in front of me because I know what's going to happen and I want to see it. So she's walking along, walking along, walking along, and all of a sudden she catches a glimpse of Angelica out of the corner of her eye, and she stops and she just turns and she goes, <gasps> And now, see, the interesting thing is this looks exactly like Angelica. Angelica stands exactly like this, perfectly poised between heaven and earth. She goes, <gasps> And she's pulled to it literally, it's just like you still must see a thread pulling her to it, and she gets up to it and she starts running her hands over it, just like the body of a lover. She's going, oh my, oh my, oh my. And then she goes, <gasps> it's hollow inside, isn't it? Just like me. There's a certain feeling in the room now, you know. And I said, yes, it is. And I said, ask it to come inside that hollow place inside you. And she goes, <gasps> and her skin flushes with color, her breathing deepens, all of her musculature relaxes. She goes, oh, oh. You see, she was in the middle of this very horrible divorce, and she was caught in this place between young and mature womanhood, and she didn't have any models in her life for how to become a mature woman. And I watched her, I said, now walk around. And I watched as Angelica taught her how to become a mature woman. And I could watch all of her musculature change. Her entire physiology shifted. And the whole time she's just going, oh my, oh my. So we found another Angelica plant and dug it and I gave her the root. She carried it in a pouch around her neck, put it under her pillow, and she took some of the tincture every day. And after a while, her menstrual cycles normalized. Right? Now, the first time I told this story, there were a bunch of medical herbalists in the room, guys, all of them, and they go, oh, that's impossible. <laughs> you know, only Don Kwai can do that. And I said, all right, <laughs> if you wish. Some living thing came in the room when I was telling that story. That's what this week is about. It's very different than information. It's something with a certain kind of impact that lies beyond the linear mind, beyond reductionism, beyond mechanicalism and surfaces. You felt something. The experience you just had is the difference between holistic and reductionistic thinking, between dissociated mentation and what Einstein was talking about, and its foundation is feeling, not thinking. Scientists who have no room in their worldview for such experiences have nothing to teach us about sustainable habitation of our home. Nor does a science in which that experience is not present. <laughs> I love what James Hillman, I love James Hillman, he said, when science was unable to locate the soul in the place they were looking, they decided it didn't exist. <laughs> and these are supposedly the brightest guys in the room, right? I love these guys that think everything is just chemical reactions. And I always ask them when they really get into it, I go, are you married? And they go, yeah. And I said, then you don't believe anything you just said. Because <laughs> if you did, your wife would have left you a long time ago. So let's go play with it a bit more. 
go a bit deeper with it. So, as is true for many people born in the West in the 20th century, my birth family was very dysfunctional. My mother was very superficial, very emotionally cold. When she said, I love you, what she meant was, I hate you. Okay. Now, you should understand the kind of impact that creates. All of us have had the experience of going up to someone we care about and going, is everything okay? And they say, oh yeah, everything's fine, but you know they're lying, right? So you can tell, but you have to understand, this happened to me before I had calibrated that as an infant. So the phrase, for me, I love you, had within it, I hate you from the beginning. You understand what I mean by this? Okay. Now, my father was actually a very kind man, but he was really ineffectual. He never really matured beyond the age of three. Okay. I was particularly close to my great-grandparents and my grandmother. They were very emotionally warm. So when I would go to their house, it would be like coming in from a cold day and there's a fire. And with them, when they said, I love you, it really meant, I love you. So I began to experience early on that form means nothing. Okay. The real failure of reductionist science is they think form has something to do with something, which it does not. It's what's inside the form that matters. I learned early on that form meant nothing. It was the meaning inside the form that is everything, and the only way to tell the difference is how it feels. Okay. This is the way the universe brings our work home to us. It brought into my awareness slight differences in meaning in the communications surrounding me, so a certain skill of perception began to develop. If my mother had not been that way, the skill would never have developed. How difficult it is to honor these most important of our teachers. My great-grandfather was especially influential in this. He was a rather remarkable man. It's where I get the name Herod. Okay. Somebody asked me when I got here, they've never done it before, but of course in England it's great. They go, the Herod, where did that come from? And I said, Herod's department store. <laughs> and I said, but these were the black sheep of the family. They were said, jail are the colonies, okay? They were not nice people. But somehow my great-grandfather, as time went on, as the family, I guess it sort of softened or something. He was quite a remarkable man. So I used to spend a lot of time with him walking in the woods. He was a, a physician that had begun practice in 1911. He used mostly plants in his practice. He saw people in their homes. They came to him, he had his office behind his house. And he really was a horse and buggy physician when he started. And I think he got his first car about, it would have been about 1920. So we used to go out and fish in this pond all the time. And it didn't matter if we caught anything or not. It was just being next to him was great and I would, lay next to him for hours by this pond, not talking. And that whole time I could feel something coming out of his body into mine. And I would breathe it in, it was like food. It is always passed in silence between the man and the boy, between the woman and the girl. It's a soul substance without which we cannot become human beings. It nourishes the soul of us, the depth of us, just the way food does our bodies. It's a fundamental experience to a human life, and all of us have similar experiences all the time. But it was the first time for me, and so I would just lay there, and his daughter and my grandmother, the same thing would happen. So I'd lay there next to him and just breathe this in, and just the smell of him, too, and the smell of deep woods and that dark soil and all of the plants. 
the most magnificent thing I'd ever known. And one day we're there like that and he goes, have you ever tasted wild water? And I said, no. So he bends over and he cups some of the water from the pond in his hand and he goes, here, try it. So I tasted some. He goes, good, isn't it? <laughs> I said, yes. And then we laid back down and that thing continued to come out of him into me. Of course, my mother caught me drinking wild water before too long and told me it would kill me and began to instill in me a fear of the wild. The journey back to wild water is a long one. After he died, I got used to the taste of domesticated water. Now, that exchange of that soul essence like that, all of us have experiences like that all the time. We just don't talk about it. We don't have a way to actually think about it, which makes it, and we don't have words for it, and those things together makes it very difficult to talk about it. I love, I'm not a big fan of Immanuel Kant, but he did say one thing. He said, uh, when the language is stolen and we have no way to speak of things, the experience follows close behind. So, but my best example is puppies. That's always the example I use. Now, puppies are great. I mean, there may be some people in here that don't like puppies, but uh, just see kittens or ducks or something. <laughs> so, you know how that is. Everybody's had that experience. Like the little six-week-old puppies, the way they are. You know, they're just so interesting. And you see one, you're sitting there, and one's walking, and they're smelling the floor as if it's the whole world. They're so in it, like, oh my God, look at this smell. Oh, this is smell. Oh, this is great. And their tail's kind of slowly wagging, you know. And their back feet are walking a little faster than their front feet, so they're kind of catty-cornered the way they are. They're just walking along. And you just watch it, and you can't, it's impossible to see that for a while and not go, here, boy, here, boy. And the puppy looks up, and he goes, it's you. It's you. I've been looking all over for you. And right in that minute, you feel this thing come up out of the puppy. You feel it go into you. And right in that moment, the puppy feels something from you go into it. And the puppy bounds over. And then the two of you want nothing more to do than to hold each other to touch. right? And you're sharing this amazing experience that we have no word for in our language. Okay. It's not love. Don't go there. We rarely ever talk of that experience. It's a discreet experience, as powerful as a sock in the jaw, as the kiss of your beloved's lips, right? It's so powerful, so real, yet we never really talk of it. Okay. There's an actual exchange of some sort, of some sort of substance that can be felt. It can occur with or without words. Something leaves my body and enters theirs, something leaves their body and enters mine, something invisible. Now I love this phrase, a kind of a way of getting to it. A human body just dead is very like one still alive, yet something invisible has left it. In this work, it's the invisibles that make all the difference. This thing that passed between my great-grandfather and I was invisible, yet it has great meaning and impact. It took me over 30 years to find the word for it. I got it through James Hillman. Unsurprisingly, it comes from the ancient Athenians. I mean, I love it like the Greek city-states. Now, the Spartans were going, who else can we have a fight with? You know, but the ancient Athenians are going, oh, this is an unusual experience. Let's name it, you know, and how do we work with it? So, they named it its, its aesthesis. It's the root of our word aesthetic. Okay. It's the moment when the soul in something in the world leaves its body and enters the human, and the soul of the human leaves and enters the other, and that moment is accompanied by an immediate inspiration of breathing in. 
The word actually means to breathe in because they realize that moment of exchange was accompanied by a gasp. <gasps> For them, the world was the source of inspiration. And one thing that it's always important to remember is we are breathed in too. Okay. It is their journey too. We are not alone, nor here for ourselves alone. Robert Bly touches on this dynamic when he says, when we begin to focus on rationality to the exclusion of all else, the human became isolated in his own house and looked out from time to time at a landscape with which he could have no meaningful contact. Or as James Hillman put it, it was only when science convinced us that the world was dead that it could begin its autopsy in earnest. Why should our soul leave our body to mingle with the soul of something else if there's nothing out there. And so we become isolated in our own house. Our lives begin to feel more and more meaningless and inspiration dries up. Our capacity for aesthesis, for feeling the touch of the world upon us, for touching it in turn, is what allows us to re-inhabit our interbeing with the world. To once more sit in the circle of life as equal members of that council most ancient and indigenous cultures knew of aesthesis and they developed capacity in its use. Our Western cultures are some of the few ever in existence, existence to have intentionally abandoned it. Like most things, moments of aesthesis run from very shallow to very deep. They don't have to be spontaneous. It's simply a way of interacting with the world that anyone can do. While telling these stories, while talking today, I'm intentionally shaping an invisible substance. I'm shaping a meaning which comes into the world and touches you. Okay. It's not by accident. Meaning itself is a living form that I'm working with. Because the words are only containers for meaning. Okay. They're buckets to carry a certain kind of water. Right. You can feel it, but I guarantee if you dissected me, you would never find it. <laughs> to the reductionist mind, it is invisible. The poet William Stafford, who I really admire a great deal, was speaking of this when he said, he was talking about writing, but it's the same thing. He says, just as the swimmer does not have a succession of handholds hidden in the water, but instead simply sweeps a yielding medium and finds it hurrying him along, so the writer passes his attention through what is at hand is propelled by a medium too thin and all pervasive for the perceptions of non-believers who have to stay on the bank to fathom his accomplishment. Okay. I'm inviting all of you this week to become swimmers of the invisible. Robert Bly was also talking about an aspect of this when he said, most of the poetry written since the rationalists and pragmatists took over language resembles a trip on land. On land, one is surrounded on all sides by recognizable objects, but when one enters the sea, the back is turned to recognizable objects and the face to something else. You might say, that since the reductionists took over science, science resembles a trip on land. Surrounded on all sides by recognizable objects, but when we enter the sea, the back is turned to recognizable objects, the face to something else, and I'm inviting all of you to enter deep waters. When we work with a thesis with the soul exchange between the human 
and the other life forms with which we share this planet, we enter an ancient sea and we leave recognizable objects behind. I will talk in depth about this this week, but just to say we live immersed in a sea of meaning that possesses complex semantics and grammar that is constantly altering itself from millisecond to millisecond in response to trillions upon trillions of complex communications. Our job, if we wish to think differently, is to first learn to perceive it, then to respond to it, then to keep ourselves as flexible as it is in order to respond congruently. This is not a technique, okay? It's a communication, and there's a huge difference there. I mean, I remember Milton Erickson was one of the great hypnotherapists of all time, and he had had polio as a child. All he could do was lay in bed. He couldn't do anything for years. And so he just observed people very deeply. And then when he re kind of recovered enough, he got, and uh, he went to medical school, which is absurd because he was still in wheelchairs and could hardly walk. But anyway, and then he becomes a psychiatrist. And so he's getting really old and he, he starts training people how to do what he does. So it's completely hilarious. He'd be in front of the room, right? And he goes, uh, so and see, somebody would, he'd say, I, I need a volunteer from the audience. And so a young woman would come up and he'd go, okay, my dear. And she'd just go into the deepest trance. Nobody could bring her out of it, right? And so he'd have all these people trying to learn what he was doing. And so they'd get somebody from the audience and they'd go, okay, my dear. And she'd just start laughing, <laughs> right? And then Milton goes, no, no, you don't understand. It's not a technique. It's a communication. He knew the deep person and that's who he talked to. And the conscious mind went to sleep and that part came awake. And they were in trance. Information in the way we normally think of it, dissociated mentation, neither can generate the experience or allow movement into its world. Nevertheless, we all possess an inherent capacity to use this form of perception and cognition to engage in this kind of communication. And all of you, while listening to different extents, moved into a different state of mind. Okay. All of you are in a different state of mind now than you were when you first came in and sat down. And guess what? You didn't need any training to do it. And you didn't need a PhD to do it. It is this movement between dry land and the depths of the sea, the movement into dark waters that this work is about. I love Mirabai, the 16th century ecstatic poet. <laughs> She wrote about exactly this thing. She was great. She goes, The colors of the dark one have penetrated Mira's body. Other colors washed out. Making love with the dark one and eating little, those are my pearls and my carnelians. Meditation beads in the forehead streak, those are my scarves and rings. That's enough feminine wiles for me. My teacher taught me this. Approve me or disapprove me. I praise the mountain energy night and day. I take the path that ecstatic humans have taken for centuries. I don't steal money nor hit anyone. What will you charge me with? I have felt the swaying of the elephant's shoulders. And now, you want me to climb on a jackass? <laughs> Try and be serious. I love her. She's great. 
the Krishna is often painted with blue skin, and that so some people in India call him the Dark One. The colors of the Dark One have penetrated Mira's body, other colors washed out. Making love with the dark one and eating little, those are my pearls and carnelians. Meditation beads and the forehead streak, those are my scarves and rings. That's enough feminine wiles for me. My teacher taught me this. Approve me or disapprove me, I praise the mountain energy night and day. I take the path that ecstatic humans have taken for centuries. I don't steal money or hit anyone. What will you charge me with? I have felt the swaying of the elephant's shoulders. And now you want me to climb on a jackass? Try and be serious. She was extremely wealthy born into a tremendously wealthy family around 1500. She married a prince who later died, and then she abandoned her position, her family, her caste, her traditional culture to follow an untouchable. Oh, they were horrified. A spiritual teacher to embrace Krishna. So her family, her, her husband had, was very rich and had this big castle, so they imprisoned her in the castle so she couldn't visit her teacher. Right? So she took all of her saris and hooked them together, tied them together, stuck it out the window, and Rapunzel'd right down, right? and went to follow him. She would leave by the window. She said, what I paid was my social body, my town body, my family body, and all of my inherited jewels. Mirabai's story still has relevance. To work with the earth directly to touch Gaia and be touched in turn means we leave our social body behind. Our town body, our family body. We strike off cross country and enter deep waters and turn our backs to recognizable objects. And in doing so, we break a powerful cultural injunction we become barbarian. We go native. We become less and less of the cities. So you should know that what we're going to work with this week is far outside the cultural paradigm. A lot of that will be concerned of what we're going to work with is concerned with a very different kind of map than the one that you've been immersed in since you started school. It's about how the world really is rather than how we've been trained to think it is. As well, I want to explore very different states of mind and perceptual capacities. Okay. Theory is fine. If you're really stoned, you're laying around at night, and you're thinking a bunch of theoretical stuff, fine. But it doesn't have much to do with the real world unless you can actually go into the world and do stuff with it. <laughs> thinking differently means thinking differently. So we'll work with the kinds of communications that those states naturally generate. We'll be working with invisible things that can't be seen but only felt. So during this time together, pay attention to what you feel. Feeling, developing the feeling sense is probably the foundational part of this work. Developing the feeling sense is an elegant and reliable tool. We have the capacity to perceive and work with very subtle meanings. So I'll just give you talk about this exercise that John Gardner, the writer, the American writer who I deeply loved, um, Ah, now we're talking. So, John Gardner was an extremely subtle teacher of writing. So he came up with this exercise that's just magnificent. It says, 
Now just be with this, this is totally the coolest thing ever. He said, so it's a, a writing exercise for writers, but you'll get an idea of the subtleties that we can perceive and work with. He said, okay, describe a barn, describe a barn as seen by a man whose son has just been killed in a war. Okay. Do not mention the son. Do not mention the war. Do not mention the son's death. Do not mention the man who does the seeing. Can you get where this is going? Okay. That man is in a particular state of mind, but you don't mention anything that put him into that state of mind. You just go into that state of mind and describe the barn. Right? If you do this well, the result will be a powerful and disturbing image, a faithful description of some apparently real barn but one from which the reader gets a sense of the father's emotion, though exactly what the emotion is, he may not be able to pin down. Okay. The meaning that's infusing the father's life is captured in the words. Someone reads it and they feel that same thing, hidden somehow in that language. When you read that thing, you perceive the subtle meaning, you take it on as your own, and then you look through that lens for a little while. Okay. This training of the feeling sense is foundational. Now, Luther Burbank, who created, co-created most of the food plants we take for granted, he had this irritating habit when I was reading his work. He always goes, you know, the key to this is repetition, repetition, repetition. So every five pages. The key to this is repetition, repetition, repetition. No, really, the key to this is repetition, repetition, repetition. I was like, yeah, I got it. No, it's repetition, repetition. So I'll be coming back to this over and over again. And as I do, if you want to hear that phrase in your mind, you may. OK, so. Did you all notice the consumer warning label? for this workshop? No, I see blank stares. Uh-oh, a couple of nods. Everybody's like, oh shit, what happened? What are we in for? You remember? It says, be prepared to have core beliefs challenged. Okay. The reason that's there is not intended to be adversarial, but rather some of this material will conflict with core beliefs. Uh, core beliefs about the reality of the world, deep cultural beliefs. For each one of you, at least one belief will be extremely uncomfortable when it gets shaken. One concept will be very uncomfortable. Some of that will come from the kind of map I'm working with. It's very different than the one you got from your parents and in school and from your culture. But again, the workshop's concerned with altering consciousness, perception, and thinking. This will bring up stuff. I remember I was in uh, seventh grade and I had a, this completely outrageous science teacher and he said, don't use the word stuff. Don't ever use the word stuff. That's what is inside of a turkey. Thanksgiving. <laughs> it was really hilarious. He was the guy that we were doing some sort of arc light experiment and he was going like, okay now everybody put your dark glasses on and don't look at it directly. You know I can do this because I've done it for so many years and he did the arc light and then he starts going, my eyes, my eyes. <laughs> The only thing I remember about the guy, <laughs> besides stuff. <laughs> stuff will come up. So I'm actively interested in developing a different kind of thinking, not just talking about it. Again, being different means actually being different. I mean, it seems obvious, but it's actually not as easy as it sounds. 
Using a different kind of thinking actually means using a different kind of thinking. Not standing here and pointing out what is needed over there. And that's one of the great failures of most environmental texts. Because embedded within the reductionist frame of reference is the belief we can stand here and look at the world over there as if we're not part of it. That's impossible because if you ran over there really quick and looked back, here would be the world too, right? We're embedded in the world all the time. We can't get out of it, all right? So as soon as anybody thinks, as soon as any kind of scientific dynamic begins where they're assuming that you can look at the world over there as if you're a disembodied observer, everything they do from that point on is insane. Because it has nothing to do with the real world. Right? I became poignantly aware of this distinction years ago and I was in tremendous distress and I went to one of my teachers. I was in a dark place and so I talked to her a long time just pouring everything out you know and she listens and nods her head, nods her head, listens, I go on and on Finally, you know, I run out of stuff, and she goes, oh, oh, I see. You've been being a bridge, haven't you? And I said, yes, and she goes, well, that's, that's nice, but you know, the only problem with being a bridge is that you yourself never get to cross over. <laughs> so you can feel that mm, thing in the room again some deep truth there. And I realized in that moment that I was being a bridge not because it's good to be a bridge, but because I was afraid of crossing over. And I told this other friend of mine, this marvelous Greek economist, and uh, I told, was telling him about this and he goes, oh, that makes perfect sense, you know, because for a bridge to be useful, there has to be two shores. And our job is becoming the other shore, crossing over. Okay. And there's a reason why people are afraid to cross over. When you cross over, you leave most cultural markers behind. You become an alien to your own society. Now, I had this friend of mine named Roger Wyeth. Roger is one of the greatest body workers I've ever met in my life, deep tissue body worker. And when he puts his hands on you, it's the most phenomenal experience. Okay, so many, many, many years ago, 30 years ago, we decided to sponsor Roger and to bring him to Colorado from where he was living. He was in California then, I guess. Everybody has to live there once in America, I suppose. And um, so we'd bring him there and we'd, you know, um, sponsor him. And it was just the most amazing work. So we, we really believed in him. We decided that we would, you know, promote him. So to do that, and he had these, the crappiest flyers ever invented for a human being to promote themselves. I mean, they're embarrassing. So we're like, nah, first we gotta get rid of those things. So we start working on, we spend this huge long marathon, the three of us who were promoting him, spend this huge marathon, like six hours. We're up really late, drinking coffee and stuff, and then finally switching to alcoholic beverages and things. And then, you know, it's very late, and we're all like, you get that thing where you look like you've been in like a, a huge store. You have Walmarts here, I don't know. You have something that like, You've been in there for hours with those fluorescent lights and your eyes are really weird. And so we're doing this and doing this and, and then finally at the very end, after like six, eight hours, at the very, very end, Roger happens to mention the most crucial thing. He says, well, you know, um, I did have a vision about this work once. So we're like, great, thanks for, you know, why you tell us at the front? And he said, we said, well, what's the vision? And so Roger says, well, I was in the shower crying. Now, this is great. You know, if you've ever cried in the shower, it's totally cool, actually. And it feels very nurturing. 
And he says, I was in the shower crying, and I'm going, God, God, tell me what to do with my life. And, and a voice comes out of the air about this far in front of him, and it says, get down on your knees, Roger. And he goes, but I'm in the shower, God. <laughs> And he goes, get down on your knees. He goes, okay, okay. He gets down on his knees and he goes, God, God, tell me what to do with my life. And God says, you're supposed to be a deep tissue body worker. You're supposed to do it in seven days and you're supposed to charge $1,000. Okay, now, you know, you can't get it clearer than that, right? <laughs> Everybody says, oh, if only I would be, I would hear it more directly. You know, I wouldn't have to figure out these subtle things. I would just go do it. I've met people that have had these kind of experiences before. It doesn't make any difference, okay? <laughs> doing it or not doing it has nothing to do with the clarity of the message. It has something to do with something else, right? So we meet Roger, and Roger is doing this deep tissue bodywork process in two weeks and charging $695, right? And what does he call his bodywork? The two-week process. And I said, you can't use that term anymore. He goes, why not? And I said, because it's, it's too weak. It's too weak. <laughs> so I had to get into his way of thinking, right? So he goes, oh, yeah, you're right. That's really bad. I don't know why I named it that. So he said seven days. Uh, you have to call it the seven-day body. I mean, isn't that a great name? The seven-day body. Isn't that fantastic? The two-week process, the seven-day body. OK, right? You can go with me here on this, right? Which one would you choose? Which one would you want to go to? OK, seven-day body. And you got to charge $1,000. He goes, OK. Great, and we write up all this copy and stuff, you know, and now we're really fried, it's like midnight or something. So Roger goes off back to California, and then he, he comes back two months later with all of the brochures that he printed up from our copy. Now, the brochures he printed looked like something a chiropractor from 1925 would have printed. Okay? <laughs> How he found a printer to do that, I don't know. But the printer said, you know, if you get 5,000 of these done, it's a lot cheaper. <laughs> so he has this big crate of this stuff. We're like, we're not giving that out. We're not giving those out. And then we open it up to the price, and it's $1,095. And I'm like, what, what is this? $1,095, we spent all these hours doing this stuff. $1,095, he goes, well, my roommate is a, a marketing specialist. That is a, your roommate or God? Okay, it's like, I don't know here. Maybe it's just me, but I got to go with God on this one. And he's going, oh, yeah, yeah. You know, but he just said I should break up the zeros. And I'm like, are you insane? God told you. You can't get a better authority than God. Screw your roommate. Okay, so he goes, all right, all right, all right. And I said, you know what? You know what? You're not allowed to give any of these flyers out. And we're taking the responsibility, the control of your flyers away from you. <laughs> So he goes, okay, so we go, okay, we're, we start designing this thing. We want to do this really great, like, you know, 11 by 17 that's folded in half and just do all this beautiful stuff. So we know this great photographer who has taken his weight in LSD. Okay, the guy's an amazing photographer. He's socially a little <laughs> malfunctional, but, you know, because you'll be sitting there with him and he'll go, <laughs> you'll go what? And he goes, Green triangle, you know, which means nothing, but it's like he goes, oh, you know, the whole time. So it's like, it takes a long time to get from here anywhere. So, so we're sitting there and we're trying, you know, we're, he's trying to create the visual image for this thing, you know, and the pictures of Roger and all this stuff. And he's really working on it. And, you know, and every time he mentions something, Roger goes, no, that won't work. You know, we do this, no, no, that won't work. Right? And do all this stuff. And then so we keep going on. It uses up all the time. Roger has to go off for in a meeting he has. And this is the most amazing thing. He opens the front door. He turns around and he goes, but I tell you what won't work for sure. And that's a picture of, this, of the galaxy behind me and my profile with my face looking out. And the, the, the photographer goes, bing. <laughs> Nobody had even mentioned that. He just, Roger goes, I tell you, that's not what we We're not going to do that. And of course, that's exactly what we did. And it was this magnificent brochure. It was fantastic. You know, so Roger would come to Colorado. This was in like 1982, a long time ago. And Roger would come to Colorado. He would make $30,000 a year in Colorado. And he would go back to California. He would go six weeks a year in Colorado, $30,000. 
goes back to California, the other 46 weeks of the year, he would make $12,000, okay? So this was Roger, always. And so finally, one day I said, Roger, you love me, don't you? And he said, yes, I do. And I said, I love you a lot. And we're friends. He goes, yes, we are. And I said, well, because you love me and I love you and we're friends, would you tell me, I'm just going to ask you a question, and would you answer completely honestly? And he said, yes. And I said, why do you always sabotage your work? And he said, because I'm afraid if I become everything I've seen, I won't be human anymore. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Was that the Lone Ranger theme? It sounded like it. Pretty sure it was. So, all of us have that fear. Okay. Everybody. Because we need, we're a tribal species, we need to belong. And when we start entering deep waters and leaving the known world behind, that fear always comes up. It's a constant problem. So, when I was, I started on this path when I was 17, and I, I just, I decided I wanted to be a wise man. I mean, it's like, it's not exactly a job description you can sell, but it started actually when I was four, because I was laying in bed with my great grandfather, he used to tell stories, and I remember laying there in his arms and just feeling that stuff come into me and I looked up at the side of his face and I thought, this is all I want to be. I want to be a wise man like him. I didn't know that the universe hears those kinds of requests. Nor did I know the price that I would have to pay. This Work is about crossing over onto a different shore. And that brings up more personal stuff than you can possibly imagine. As Goethe once put it, he said, this work, this has worked my poor ego in ways I hardly thought possible. <laughs> so, just to get a little bit clearer, clearer, I want to define what I mean by feeling, okay? In general, feeling means one of three things. The stove feels hot. That's an easy one. We've all burned the shit out of ourselves once or twice. It's also, I don't feel well. Okay. But there's the third one where you go, you walk into a restaurant. Everybody's done this. Hey, there's a new restaurant. Let's go there. And you get in, you walk in the door, and you both stop and you go, ooh, this place feels weird. Let's go someplace else. Everybody had that. That's the kind of feeling I'm talking about. It's the non-kinesthetic touching of the world. Okay. The thing is, there's a thing all of you did when you got here today. Every one of you did it. You do it all the time. You walked into the room and you pause just a second and you check out how it feels. Right? You go, oh, okay, this feels all right. And then you look at, you know, then you look at the chairs and you go, Let's see, where do I want to sit? Ooh, not that one. And then you go, you find the chair. And you know what? So you make a relationship with the chair you're in. And you know what? That chair will feel more special than all the other chairs in the room. <laughs> so what will happen is, we get used to this, but then we'll go over to the Great Hall on Wednesday. And when you walk in there, just pay attention to what you do. Because you're going to walk in and you're going to go, oh, how does this feel? You just do it. It just takes a millisecond of time. Everybody does it. It's a skill base that we all have. We're just not trained in it. We're virtually the only culture on earth that isn't trained in it in the West. So, about beliefs. I don't actually like to use the word beliefs anymore. The word's been used so much it's become a cliche. I like software. Because it actually says what a belief does, programs behavior, okay? I love like real computer geeks. I don't know if anybody in here is like into the serious computer geek world, 
But you know what we are? We're meatware. And our, our, our programming, our beliefs, that's wetware. <laughs> so you have hardware, software, meatware, wetware. Yeah, those guys are really strange. <laughs> so the beliefs that we have, when that we were taught, we, have, we were taught them in school, we were taught them by our parents, we absorbed them from culture about the nature of reality. They're software. They're a map of the world. They are not the territory. Okay? They're a map. And the maps we have have very little to do with the actual world we inhabit. Part of the reason for the ecological devastation of the planet is the map that the Western world is using doesn't have anything to do with the world we actually live in. So they're applying this map as if it's real, and they keep getting these weird side effects from it. So then they apply the map to the side effect, and they get more side effects, right? And so, in a way, I don't know if you all notice this, everybody's awfully afraid these days. And the United States, Britain, most of the countries are terrified. It's at a level too deep for words. But they're trying to apply that map more and more rigorously all the time as if that will somehow allow them to regain control. But all that's going to happen is it will make the gyrations worse. As Paul Krugman once put it, these are times of madness dressed in good suits. So every belief we have is, a, is like a software that shapes how and what we can perceive of the world. There are lens through which we see things. Beliefs are shortcuts. They're an explanation about the world. We don't have to examine something every time we encounter it. Okay? Now, babies don't have a map. All of you have seen new babies, haven't you? One time or another, in the way they're just caught up in the wonder of everything. They don't have a map. They're getting caught up in the novelty of everything they encounter as if it was the first time. The, a ball, a block, a pencil, a cigarette butt, they're all the same. They're completely fascinating, right? They see, they're totally new to them. They see with new eyes every time they don't see a ball, by the way. They see something else entirely. Okay. We see a ball because we have a name for the thing. Okay. <coughs> so Goethe said that often, how hard it is not to put the sign in the place of the thing, the name in the place of the thing. Babies perceive the meaning of the thing itself. No two balls are the same. They're very different. They perceive its underlying meanings of which ball is only a tiny part. We usually see a ball, a block, a pencil, a cigarette, but we have a little commentary in our mind about every one of those things we see and then we sort of move on. We've already identified them. We know what they are. We don't really perceive them anymore. Okay. The software does it for us automatically. In consequence, we stop seeing what is right in front of us. I love George Bernard Shaw. I have in my writing room signed things from all of the writers I admire to keep me honest. And George Bernard Shaw, his says, yours out of all patience. So every time I start thinking about selling out, my eye invariably goes to his first, to that picture of him with that yours out of all patience. He was quite a grumpy curmudgeonly fellow in a lot of ways, but he had some great things. And this is one of them, he goes, the only man who knows me is my tailor. For he is the only one who, every time he meets me, measures me anew. Okay. 
Software impacts are extremely complex. And I've spent a lot of time over the last 40 years playing with my software. So I find myself incredibly fascinating. <laughs> so I spent a lot of time doing the most amazing things. So I shift my software and I notice how it shifts my perception of the world, right? And it's just fascinating to me how software affects perception. So we'll play, I'm gonna give you some ideas of that because it's gonna become crucial in this week that we're having, right? So now culturally, if let's say, oh, let's just to pick something out of the hat. If women would be considered inferior to men because they don't think as well, that would act as a lens or a piece of software that would affect the cultural structure and how women were treated. Does that make sense? Okay. Any, I mean, I know it's a completely outrageous thought, but. <laughs> it would affect how people in that culture saw the capabilities of women. It affects how they were treated, how others would interact with them. Men trained to believe that from birth, it would be just software that affected their behavior. You have to understand, for the vast majority of men, there would be no malevolence in their behavior. It would just be the software controlling or uh, moderating how their behavior was generated. So they're just ignorant, right? So the whole point is they just need to change their software, okay, to be more accurate to the world. Does that make sense? Right? Are we still struggling with that one? <laughs> is that still a problem some places? But just think about that. <clears throat> I mean, here's what's fascinating. You know, I'll just, I have, I have a pre-ramble, I can't help it. Anyway, <clears throat> so one of the things I would like to do is I would just say to people, well, just I tell you what, I tell you what, do this. Just assume women are inferior to men. Take that on and then go interact with a woman and see how well you do. <laughs> right? Okay. The thing is, we have those same kind of beliefs about bacteria, okay? And they're just as amused as women at encountering it, <laughs> okay? And you might say resistant bacteria are the feminists of their clan. <laughs> that's, that's a novel way of looking at it, isn't it? We also look at plants that way. I mean, for God's sake, the man was in a car wreck, now he's a vegetable. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> I'll be here all week. So, <laughs> you think, and like, that's the thing, it's like a vegetable. It's like, it's like basically, you can't get hardly anything less intelligent than that. <laughs> so, it's like, we approach, see, and, but most of you haven't thought of it that way. You don't have any malevolence about it. You just know that bacteria are inferior. You know that plants aren't very intelligent and you're approaching the world that way. But believe me, they're not amused. Okay. It's just software, okay? It affects behavior. It's not malevolent. It just comes out of a certain kind of ignorance. It just needs to be changed, right? With a better map, okay? Now, beliefs are software and they have tremendous real-world impact. So I've spent the last 45 years, since I was 17, actively constructing a map that's more accurate to the world. That's what I decided I wanted to do. So I wanted to have as little distortion in my perceptions and my relationship to the world as possible. Okay. So I was lucky the 60s were going on. I left home at 16. I thought, man, I'm not going to stay around here anymore. Finally, I filed emancipation papers and away I went, hitchhiked to California and got there on January 1st, 1969. I didn't want to miss anything. Okay. And oddly enough, there was a kind of a saying going around then about do the work you love become who you're really meant to be. Right? And I, for some reason, rather foolishly thought, 
great, I'll do that. <laughs> it actually interfered with my ability to hold jobs. I had to end up working for myself, mostly. But that was a big part of it, finding an accurate map, creating an accurate map. That's part of what this week is about, is a more accurate map, because believe me, the world is much different than anything you've been taught. As Thoreau put it once, he said, you must understand nothing is what you've taken it to be. Nothing. We understand less than 1% of what goes on here. Changing software is often very difficult. I mean, think about how hard it's been just to change software about women and about people of color, right? A natural fear of the other gets leveraged by the powerful in culture, and this is true of all cultures. We're a tribal species. There's a natural fear of people outside our tribe and the powerful leverage it for their benefit. All of us get afraid, and it's easy to put that fear on the fear of the other. And when I've been working with bacteria for gee, 25 years or so. I love them. And it's astonishing the terror of the other that is focused on bacteria. And I'll talk about that in depth some this week. Most problems occur when software is connected to deep survival needs. Okay? That is, if self-identity is based on the belief that women are inferior, any challenge to that belief will generate a powerful emotional response connected to primal survival. Some people will just change, others will fight the change with every thing that they can. Now, if the economic structure is based on that software, then economic interest will fight it with everything they can. Because to a certain extent, their survival really will be at stake and they become afraid. I heard a great line the other day. I don't remember who said it. This is a really nice one. Fanaticism is doubt shouted loud. Fanaticism is doubt shouted loud. So when you meet a reductive mechanicalist and you start talking to them about how plants are intelligent and they start shouting at you, just start screaming, doubter, doubter. <laughs> <laughs> Significant paradigm shifts are never pleasant. There will be no harmonic convergence. It will be a very difficult shift. If self-identity is based on software, then it's frightening to change it. It's below conscious levels. It's primal. So if someone believes that humans are the only intelligent organism on the planet, any challenge to that will generate powerful emotional responses. Okay? And we have a tremendous fight going on now between the reductive mechanicalists and the animists. Okay? As soon as you say Gaia, that's animism, my friend. And the mechanicalists, the bastions of calm rationality, begin screaming emotionally within just a few seconds. Okay. It's the reason the Gaia concept has upset so many. Now, it seems self-evident. None of you would be here if you didn't have some affinity for the Gaia concept, the feeling that the Earth is alive. I'm deep Gaia. I met this guy, he comes to Silver City. It's weird, all these people that seem to end up in Silver City, New Mexico, where I live. It's a really strange town. It's stuck in the 1950s. I think the city council's motto is, no idea too stupid to be implemented. <laughs> <laughs> they just think nepotism is the way business should be conducted. Okay, and they continually enact these stupid things that never work out for anybody. But nevertheless, all these people end up there because it's a little town on the road to nowhere. You can actually buy a house there for $35,000 US. Was that 20,000 pounds? And you can pay for it working at the local burger joint, which they pay $10 an hour. Now, I've never seen anything like that anyplace else. And it's 
nestled right next to two of the largest wilderness areas in the United States. So people end up there. And, uh, but there's a lot of strange people from all over that go there. And there's one guy, Tyler Volk, who's a Gaia guy. I actually like Tyler and used a number of his things in um, my new book, Plant Intelligence. But when he found out I was a deep Gaia, he's shallow Gaia. When, I found out he, when he found out I was deep Gaia, he wouldn't come by anymore. We couldn't play music anymore. It was sad. It's really sad. <laughs> So, I mean, and so that's interesting. When Gaia showed up, now there's, there's three forms of Gaia. There's Earth System Science. Those are the guys in suits. And then there's Shallow Gaia. Those guys wear jeans <laughs> and ties. And then there's Deep Gaia, and we dress like this. <laughs> I'm working on Stefan back there to change his sartorial decisions. <laughs> to more flamboyantly become who he really is. Each of us has powerful survival investments in our software. It's fine to speak of these things when they don't actually hit a survival reflex, okay? But when they do, the stronger that reflex is, the more powerful the emotional response. So, let's just play with it a little bit. I am mischievous. Okay. So I read a lot. Like for my last book, Plant Intelligence, I probably read 30 or 40 books and about 2,500 journal articles. Okay? And that's quite common for me. And I read probably 40,000 other articles per year easily. And uh, I mean, when I was a kid, I would read the cereal box, all four sides, top and bottom, actually technically six sides. Is the thumb a finger or not? <laughs> the great philosophical questions of our time. The answer is yes, it's a finger. Okay, now you know how kids, I'm sorry, it's a pre-ramble. You know how kids, they go, every kid's asked this, mom, do the cows in France move different than the cows in America? And every mother goes, no, honey, they actually, they do have an accent. <laughs> cows in different countries, they move differently. All animals, they have a regional accent. Okay. And unfortunately, I can't move with a French accent. I would love to do it because it would be hilarious. <laughs> it's like, okay, all right, that didn't work. <laughs> anyway, I don't remember even why I got on that thing. But okay, so I, was re I read all this stuff. So I was reading, a lot of really, I run into a lot of really strange articles that I find. So the other day, I read this article about, okay, in, in these Middle Eastern countries, they surgically remove the clitoral hood of women, they dry it, and they make it into a lotion for men to use on their skin to soften their skin. Okay. Does that sound weird to you? Okay. It's not true. <laughs> but I'll tell you what is true. In the United States, they save all the circumcised skin of young boys and they make a lotion for women to use on their skin. Okay. Oprah uses it, swears by it. Okay. Now, isn't that, do you get the energy in the room? But <laughs> okay, but the interesting thing is, as you heard the story, which one did you have the strongest emotional response to? Just shout it out when you know. We, second one? Who said second one? Oh, bless you, dear. You're about the, the seventh person that said that. <laughs> Nearly everybody in the States, it's the first one really sets them off. Okay. But the second one, not so much. Because circumcision of male boys in the States is considered normal behavior. Right? It fits the software, the template. Right? But because the United States, most of the audiences I speak to, they're so edgy about women's rights that the first one seriously sets them off, way more than the second. So in a sense, what you get there is you get a sense of a slightly different software producing an emotional response. Does that make sense? Follow what I'm saying? 
So those differences in response is just a software dynamic. Now what's fascinating with something like that, I do this stuff all the time, okay, this is really fun for me. So what you do is you have the emotional response and you freeze it in place. And then you start running it back really slow, like a film going backwards. You run back really, 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 really slow to right on the other side of when you had the response. And then you move it back even slower. You keep going over that little hump back and forth. And so you can slow down and begin to notice exactly what's happening in your interior world. And I do that to help myself identify software in myself. Because anytime I have those responses, it's activating a software dynamic. And then what I do is I begin contemplating the software and deciding whether or not it's useful or accurate or whether I want to keep it. And if not, then I figure out what would be more accurate software and I make new software. And then I replace the old software with the new software. Okay. <laughs> the reasons for each response are embedded within the software. And examining the software will reveal a lot about things most people would rather not examine. So again, the more software is connected to survival, the more emotionally powerful the response when it's activated. So let's go even a little deeper with it. Okay, now imagination is really important in this work. Imagination is one of the ways you can get to understanding software. So what I want you to do, hi, welcome. Hi. Were you the one held up by leaves? Okay, well I just heard that there were some leaves that were preventing the trains from moving. I've never heard that before, so. I wasn't minded that. No, it was a signaling problem. Oh, signaling problem. Okay. Welcome. So, you got here just for the, the amazing part. <laughs> so here's, here's what I want you to do, and I want you to imagine this as if it's real, that you really have to do this, okay? Really. It will be necessary for each of you during this workshop to come up in front of the room, very slowly disrobe until you're naked while everybody watches, and then tell us about yourself. That brings up some stuff, doesn't it? Okay. Now there's usually two or three people who get really excited <laughs> at the idea. And you see them going, I can't, me first. <laughs> I've, I've so wanted to do this in a workshop, they yell out. <laughs> okay, but if you let yourself really imagine that, then all of the stuff that comes up in response, that's software, right? And it's very powerful, it's connected to very powerful survival dynamics, right? Being naked in public is a cultural taboo. It's a very powerful one. And it brings up an emotional response connected to survival. Now if you stay with that, okay, if you allowed yourself to really believe you would have to be naked in front of the group, after the first shock and all of those uncomfortable feelings, for most people the next thing that happens is they start thinking about the parts of their body that they don't think are attractive. Okay. The parts of their body that they think other people won't love that they themselves don't like, that you believe make you a bit unlovable. Okay. The nudity taboo naturally creates a sense of shame. It cannot help but do so. 
because have you ever seen how little children like to take their clothes off and just run around? You have to keep getting them in the clothes over and over and over till they finally get they have to be in the clothes, right? But for a chi little child, they have to make up a reason for it. And they finally come to realize there's something wrong with naked bodies. Very specifically, there must be something wrong with my body. Okay. It's inevitable. It's like social Darwinism. You can't get it out of Darwinism. It's impossible. Okay. Actually, I should say you can't get it out of Neo-Darwinism because Darwin didn't actually believe most of the things they say he believed. So. You get immediately, something's wrong with my body, somehow I'm not lovable, it's not pretty enough, it's not attractive enough, I have to hide these parts. Okay. Right. And this is one of the reasons why researchers over and over and over again find that men and women who regularly pose nude experience an increase in self-esteem because they work through the nudity and the shame taboo. Realistically imagining you have to be naked brings those two underlying dynamics into play so you can see their influences. And then you can decide if you want to keep that software or not. Okay. Doing this, you give up your cultural body. Also, such nakedness by natural extension touches on the repression of sexuality, common in the West, the sex taboo, which itself has even more powerful survival elements attached to it if it's brought openly into the room. This is part of the importance of imagination as a tool in this work. It casts a light that allows shadows inside of us to be seen. It brings software into focus. Embracing the shadow dynamics and working with them is crucial in this work. Now, I love um, Robert Louis Stevenson, one of my favorite, favorite people, and Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, one of the greatest books ever written. Now, the reason why it's such a great book, and it perfectly captures the shadow side of the New Age and my liberal tribe better than almost anything else, right? Okay? So, Dr. Jekyll, he's a kind man that cares only for the good of, of the other, of others. He has a wonderful office and he sees poor people. He helps heal them. And he only cares about that. He's completely selfless about it. But you know what happens, weirdly enough, is that late in the night, his shadow side, Mr. Hyde, always appears someplace else in the city doing very cruel things, right? And Robert Louis Stevenson captured so greatly what happens when we repress a part of ourselves? Any part of ourselves we repress will become hostile to us. Okay. So the part of us that we put in the long bag of shadow we carry behind us, for instance, our naked body becomes a shadow. Right. So I spend a lot of time imagining different scenarios putting myself into them in order to see my software by the shadows that are cast. Now, none of the emotional responses that you've experienced about nudity are inherent in the concept of nudity. They just aren't there. It's just software. They're human generated. Okay? The Romans and the Greeks did not have a nudity taboo. Right? <laughs> Yeah. The public toilets in like the Roman cities, there weren't, there weren't any stalls. There were just a long row of, of holes in the ground. Now, I just think that's hilarious because I have a friend of mine, Nadam, and Nadam went to India and he was in this 10 day uh, intensive in India and everybody had to be naked the entire time. Okay. So he, you know, he was like, oh, okay, because he, he knew that. But he didn't realize that the toilets 
we're in this really long room and there's just holes in the floor going down like about 50 of them in a row. So he couldn't go. He just couldn't go. So he would late, wait late until the night, right? And then he would go in about 2 in the morning. He'd get in, he'd go way down to the end. And so he finally, the first time he does it, he goes way down to the end. He's squatting over the hole and he's going, oh, God, oh, God. And then he hears a noise and he looks up and there's this enormously obese woman, completely naked, coming in the door. And she walks in and he goes, don't, no, don't, come down, don't. And she comes all the way down very slowly, very slowly, very slowly, and gets right next to him and squats down and she looks over at him and goes, she goes, you aren't used to this, are you? <laughs> It's like, no. <laughs> and don't worry, you will be. <laughs> there's one thing's for sure. If it goes in here, it's coming out there. So they didn't have the nudity taboo. It was just very different in Rome and the Greeks. And actually, in Rome, I've been reading a lot of neat stuff about her. I love Mary Beard, who's English. She just writes a lot of great stuff on Rome. And sex was rather public as well in a certain kind of sense. So when a couple would be engaging in different sexual positions, they would have their servants or their slaves help move them into the proper positions and hold them there, right? So that they could do these kind of like gymnastic things. Unfortunately, that, they didn't really describe in the book what those were. I was quite disappointed, you know? But isn't that, well, isn't that a strange concept? Right? To, to think that you're just like, oh, Mary, could you come over and help us, please? <laughs> we, 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 I've been hung up here. <laughs> oh, that's it. You know, so, I mean, just imagining that brings up stuff. But in those cultures, there was no shame attached to it, no sense of doing something wrong. It's just normal behavior. They're software allowed it. But I was reading this, this other book, and this guy was going, yeah, you know why? Because they had a less advanced sense of shame. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, so we get this evolutionary escalator. You know, at first, they pooped anywhere they wanted. You know, and then they pooped in long lines. You know, they had sex wherever they wanted to. Then they had sex, but their, their servants would help. But now, now we're always isolated because we have an advanced sense of shame. That's what happened, you know? So I just completely dis disagree with that fellow. So what you're experiencing about public nudity is a software conflict. And many software conflicts will arise in the course of this week. These taboos or these softwares, they affect behavior and perception. They don't just affect behavior, they affect perception, okay? If you think a woman doesn't think as well as a man, even if she thinks, you can't see it, right? Does that make sense? If you think a plant is not intelligent, the plant can do whatever it wants. It can stand over there holding a sign. The first act of disobedience is contemplation and you'll never see it, okay? Because you know it's not true. I forget who said it. They said, some things have to be believed to be seen. Okay. So when those taboos are culturally leveraged over and over and over again. So you see why Mirabai was saying, what I left behind was my town body, my social body. So they're connected to the need to belong. And that's what Roger was terrified of, being cast out. Becoming so different, he is cast out. Just changing your thinking causes disruption. I'll talk a lot more about psychotropics as the week goes on, but Albert Hoffman did this fascinating experiment once in Switzerland. He gave, there was a, a tribe of chimpanzees they were working with, and they took one of them and gave it LSD, quite a nice dose actually, and he put it back in the, in the, with the group, and all the chimpanzee did was sit there and stare at the ground. I mean, he was totally in the holy shit stage of the trip. And he's just sitting there going, wow, all of the other chimpanzees went crazy. Ape shit, you might say. <laughs> 
The chimpanzee wasn't doing anything, but they could just tell he was no longer in the same frame of reference. Okay. So confronting those kind of softwares, it brings up the conflict between the need to belong. So, and you got a bit, a bit of a sense about how strong the responses can be. Okay, some material this week will activate similarly strong responses when it does just notice it. I'm not married to it, you know. Just take what you need, leave the rest. My purpose is not to confront your software, but just to explore a more accurate map that includes the out there, there as well as the in here. And explore how shifts in perception and software allow access to the depths of the world, to the metaphysical background. Certain shifts enhance perception, gathering plant knowledge directly from plants, understanding Gaia and Gaian function. You can't use a different kind of perception if you don't think it exists. You can't hear plants talk to you if you think they can't. So these shifts take us into a very different territory that is unusual in the West. We shift out of a human orientation and move into a Gaian orientation. In consequence, what the human is, how we see it, shifts considerably. So human beings are not very important in the scheme of things. Human beings are not very important in the scheme of things. We automatically are trained to orient ourselves around the human as the most important. That's software. It's not accurate. If humans disappear, the earth will be just fine. If bacteria disappear, we will all die immediately. Okay. Bacteria and plants are fundamental. We are not. We've been taught that humans are the most intelligent species, the most intelligent genus species organisms on the planet. We are not. There are organisms here far more intelligent than human beings. There are organisms here far more intelligent than human beings that have larger neural structures than ours by many order orders of magnitude. Okay. See, that's not something that you heard in school. And it brings up stuff. It's like, could that really be true? Yes, it's really true. And we'll get into that during the week. But that statement confronts some beliefs. Now, I got invited a while back to go to Hong Kong and teach. And it was when I was going, I'm not going to go anywhere to teach anymore. I'm done. But this guy he emails me and he goes, will you come to Hong Kong to teach? And we have these magnificent botanic gardens. I was like, no, I don't want to. And he goes, we'll let you stay in the bungalow that Jane Goodall stays in when she comes. And I went, well, I pretty much have to go. Because, I mean, I'm not going to be laying on my deathbed and go, I could have stayed and slept in Jane Goodall's bed. <laughs> Did any of, any of you all see that, that T-shirt? That it was the far side, it was, you know the far side cartoons, you ever watch those or see those? And there was a t-shirt made out of it too, and, but it, it said uh, there's this chimpanzee in a tree and this other chimpanzee comes up on the limb and the first chimpanzee looks at the second one and goes, you've been with that good old bitch again, haven't you? Yeah. <laughs> Oh, that was hilarious. So Jane Goodall had a t-shirt made of it for all these people that came to her workshops. Uh, that was lovely. So, but anyway, so this guy in Hong Kong wants me to come teach, right? And so, you know, we got it all arranged, but then their funding fell through. But anyway, he felt really bad about that. And so he wrote me later. He says, well, we have these magnificent gardens, and we've used some of your quotes from Lost Language of Plants, but, you know, could you come up with some other signage? Or signage, such a weird name. Could you come up with some more signage for us? And I looked through all their stuff and I said, well, really, about the only thing left that you didn't cover is the intelligence of plants. I mean, they're, they have a significant intelligence, sometimes surpassing that of humans. He goes, ooh, a brain wobble. <laughs> he says, I don't, I don't think we could. Do you have sources for that? And I said, sure, here's the sources. And he's going, ooh. Mm. 
Mm, uh, it's just a brain wobble. I don't think we can do that. But I came up with the term brain wobble. It's just a great, a great term, brain wobble. So <laughs> you're going to have brain wobbles. <laughs> it's inevitable, right? So I'll be looking at things from a non-human point of view. It'll stir up things. It'll interfere with the orientation most of us use to orient ourselves in space, time, and culture. It disrupts the markers we use to identify who we are. Okay. The process of opening the doors of perception and entering the metaphysical background entails the stripping away of software that interferes with our ability to do so. The early process is moderately easy. It's how we all get sucked into it. Ooh, ooh the forest is so luminous. I love it. And look at that light. Ooh, I love this. I want to be like this always. That's how you get sucked in. Because right? you start knowing there's something there more than the human that feels just delicious. And you start going deeper and deeper and deeper into it until pretty soon you find you've crossed this bridge. You start getting around your family and they're going, hmm, something strange about him. <laughs> The concept that the earth is alive doesn't upset you. Otherwise, you wouldn't be here. Hearing me say it and talk about a lot of these things is probably a relief to have them said out loud. But if I start to go deeper, some things may begin to interfere. So, okay, here's one. Here's a great piece of software. Okay, just pay attention. Just let this, I'm going to say this. Let it, let it percolate inside. And then notice, notice what you do in response. There's no such thing as a bad food. There's no such thing as a bad food. <laughs> I can just feel like and hear, well, what about, <laughs> right? Aren't all they doing that? Well, what about, yeah, but what about? What about GMOs? That's bad food. What about crisps? <laughs> <laughs> Everybody's got something that's coming up. But that's a bad food, isn't it? No, there's no such thing as a bad food. It's true. It's no, there's no such thing as a bad food. There's no such thing as a bad food. Okay. It is a brain wobble, isn't it? So all food is good. All food is good. It doesn't matter what it is. But as that statement penetrates, it gets, you get these wobbles going on. And I would imagine for some of you, there's a part of you really getting some energy going on it. Don't say that. You'll make people think there's no such thing as a bad food. <laughs> and then they'll go out and they'll, they'll, uh, they'll support bad food. You know, and so it's like... <laughs> if inside you the concept of bad food is connected with either personal our planetary survival, our even moral behavior, stuff's going to come up. Okay. And for some people, the moral behavior they have attached to the concept of bad food is connected to their right to be alive now. Okay. If I do not support good food and act against bad food, I'm complicit in an evil thing. So, there's no such thing as a bad food. Of all of the things I've taught in the last 35 years, that one statement has stirred up people more than anything else, <laughs> which is why I love saying it. Okay. I will tell you what's more important than good or bad food. It's engaging in the holy communion of breaking bread with yourself. There's that feeling in the room again. It changes things from the surface to the depths. The most important thing is engaging in the holy communion of breaking bread with yourself. Okay. It's 
see it shifts everything, doesn't it, when that comes in. Right? We're someplace else now. We started here and then somehow in hearing that we took this long floating leap and we ended someplace else dealing with the depths of things. <coughs> and see how simple it was to move from one state deeper into the metaphysical background of the world because that's where we went. We went from the sixth continent to the seventh just in that moment. And it happened because a certain meaning entered the room that changed the conversation. Okay. It changed it from a reductive, linear, mechanicalistic conversation to something else infused with invisibles, that line to engage in the holy communion of breaking bread with yourself is soaked in psychic force. It's soaked in deep meaning it's soaked in invisibles. And when that touched you, something came reverberating down inside of you that shifted everything. When we experience conflicts between our software and the way the world really is, it's often very difficult to resolve it. One of the sources of depression is exactly that, okay? We have a software we're moving through the world and the world begins pushing back and it starts telling the deep parts of us that the software is incorrect, but we don't want to hear it, okay? And so what happens is we begin to become depressed. Depression can mean a number of things, but one of the major things depression indicates is that your software is in conflict with the truth about the world. The world is trying to get your attention. And your, this mind won't listen, so what happens is a deeper part of you becomes depressed. And the depression gets so heavy that it finally percolates up and this part notices it and you go, God, I'm depressed. And everybody, when they feel that, depression is the way the world makes darkness visible to us. Okay. It's the way it makes shadow visible to us. So it comes percolating up in every one of us, myself included, the very first tendency is to run away from it as fast as we possibly can because it feels terrible. Okay. It takes a long time to learn that the only way out is to stop, to turn, to face the darkness and to look into it and ask, why? What is this about? Doing that, Robert Bly refers to as eating shadow, which I particularly love that. So, and the, the interesting thing is, the more shadow you eat, things really change. And you know, when you start going around other people, they can tell you've eaten something they haven't. <laughs> so, it's really the way through. And then you go deeper and you eat the shadow, you go deeper, you go deeper, and then you start to find what the world is trying to tell you, what's wrong with your software. It's one of the major clues, the major ways we're given direction for our life. Every time you hit something like that, and you resolve it, and you change, you leave your families a little bit further behind, you leave your cultures a little bit further behind. You begin to carry something else inside of you. One of the things I decided when I was 17 is, I, in California, and I visited some old growth redwoods, and I had this thought at the time, I thought, you know, I bet there's such a thing as old growth human beings. Mm -hmm. And I think I would like to become old growth like those trees. Okay. I had no idea what I was asking. Unfortunately, the universe heard it. <laughs> There's this guy, Dale Pendle. Anybody know Dale Pendle in here? I write about him a lot. I love Dale Pendle's work. He wrote these books called Pharmacopoeia, 
pharmacodynamics, pharmacognosis, the tales of the poison path. And in pharmacognosis in the beginning, he says, because uh, he, he actually made most of the psychotropics he took, he took as many as he could possibly take and then wrote about the experiences. And so he had this lab and he's making all this stuff. And uh, he put a sign up over his door that said, demons welcome here. And he said, unfortunately, they already had the address. <laughs> <laughs> they already had the address. Yeah, so when you make agreements like that, the invisibles of the world kind of already hear it, you know. They're not limited by the same kind of ears we have. So when we begin changing this stuff, we leave our families and our cultures behind, even to some extent what we think of as the human. Okay. The more you become Gaia, the more you become Earth speaking on behalf of herself, the less human-oriented you become. Okay. You become barbarian, you go native. Over time, every belief is stripped away, including much of what we think of as our self-identity, this work, if you follow it to the end, will cost you everything that you are. Eventually, there's nothing left but our breathing, the touch of our beloved's hands, our relationship with the ensouled phenomena around us, their touch upon us, our touch upon them. There is a stripping away a simplifying and a remaking. And this reworking of software is essential. Okay. I mean, in a way, you can think of it kind of like a microscope, I suppose. The software is a lens through which we see the world. And what you're doing is you're starting to make the lens in such a way that you become, as Emerson said, a transparent eyeball. Okay. That the truth passes through you living and intact. Okay. So it's like grinding lenses in a sense, so that what you see is what's really there. So again, my point in all this is not disruption, but to enable you to see through Gaia's eyes, through plant eyes, through other eyes than the human. So if you have an emotional response, just notice it. Think about the software that's underneath it and whether it's useful or not. And again, from all the material, take what's relevant to you and disregard the rest. Okay. The stuff is for you. Take what is useful to you. And look, use it however you want. <laughs> I don't own it. Nobody does. These things, the meanings of things, the truths that we find are here. They just pass through each one of us in our lifetime. Okay? But they were here before and they'll be here after. So please take anything you want from the week. Use it however you want. Disregard what you don't like. Give me credit if you want. If you don't want to give me credit, don't give me credit. Just make sure you get the serial numbers filed off completely. <laughs> okay. So I invite you to do that. I mean, there is this great this writer, this woman I was reading, they said, uh, what do you do when you can't think of anything to write? She says, oh, I plagiarize. <laughs> says, now that plagiarism has is, is, uh, saved many a writer. You just take something that really moves you and you plagiarize it. You write it down and then it'll spark all these thoughts and then off you go, right? And there was a great a movie that I particularly liked called Finding Forrester. Anybody see it? No, I can't believe it. My God, I have to educate you and, and, and about film as well. <laughs> it starred uh, Sean Connery. Oh, you know what 007 means? It's a number of times Sean Connery's been back to Scotland. <laughs> 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 yeah.
Okay, Evelyn, where are you? Was that funny? Yeah. <laughs> That's so. <laughs> She's Scottish. So, sorry, Sean Connery and Matt Damon's got a little role in it, and there's a black actor who I don't know, but it's a magnificent, magnificent film about, it's loosely based on sort of, I guess, uh, J.D. Solinger gave him the idea. So he uh, plays a guy, Sean Connery did, who wrote this great bestseller. It's considered one of the greatest books of all time in American literature, but he never wrote another one, and he's been a recluse for like 50 years, right? So it's about this, and now the neighborhood he's in is a black ghetto. So he's got this reputation as kind of this weird, crazy guy. So they dare this one young black guy to go up and sneak in his apartment and take something from it, right? So he does, but Sean Connery never leaves it, so he scares him and the kid leaves his notebooks behind. And the kid's a writer, and so Sean Connery starts editing his stuff. And they have this most marvelous relationship. It's just fantastic. And there's a great scene in there where the kid can't think of something to write, and he goes, well, here, plagiarize. Take this story of mine, take the first paragraph, type it out, and see where it goes. It's beautiful. It's a very inspiring. It'll make you glad to be alive. There's a lot of great movies that'll make you glad to be alive, because you know, all of us need help from time to time. Life's tough. The predicament, the human predicament is difficult. Finding Forrester's good. Chef, anybody seen Chef? It's a new, new movie. Yeah, isn't it great? Didn't it make you feel good to be alive? I'm hungry to tell. Yeah, well, Chef. <laughs> chef, okay. Um, safety not guaranteed. Anybody see that? Oh, I can't believe it. This is just terrible. <laughs> it's the most, the most charming independent film. Okay. Um, my First Mister. That has got to be the greatest independent film I've ever seen in my life. Okay, that you, you must see these films. Finding Forrester, My First Mister, Safety Not Guaranteed. Now there's a lot of them, but these, these four in Chef, it'll, you'll be hungry. Don't do drugs before you see Chef. <laughs> you'll get, become enormously fat. So <laughs> it's all about food the entire time. So, the thing is, they're great, and it's like it's always nice to have stuff like this because um, I remember, um, what was that woman that was the real famous critic for the New York Times film critic? Anybody remember her Pauline name? Pauline Kael. Yeah, yeah, Pauline Kael, thanks. Excellent. Uh, who said that? Oh, you, are you again, oh, you get a star. It's amazing. <laughs> Try to be like her. <laughs> so Pauline Kael said, one of the most amazing experiences as a human being that she'd ever had is feeling incredibly depressed and in a difficult place. She walks into a theater and gets caught up in the magic of this story, and then at the end she noticed everybody in the audience is caught up with her in this common experience of what's possible. She said, what a magnificent thing. Okay. So those will help you when times are hard. 